Hi everyone, you're watching the Michael McLean Talks interview with Janet Hills, MB, the former chair of the National Black Met Police Association and the National Black Police Association. Please remember to like, share, subscribe and comment and I hope you enjoy the interview. Thank you so much for coming on to the platform. It's a huge honor just to have you on here. You have you are a huge um, influencer within the Met Police. You were the first female to chair the Met Police Association, and you were also the chair of the National Black Police Association. You have shared uh, platforms with the likes of Doreen Lawrence. You've met the likes of David Lammy. So thank you so much for taking the time out to come onto the platform. Uh, my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, please tell us about your early life growing up in Corrieding and joining the Met. So I am from a Jamaican household. My parents uh, were first, first generation um, with Rush in terms of coming over here. Uh, they're from Westmoreland and from St. Elizabeth, my dad's from St. Elizabeth. So that's the combination that uh, we had in the UK. I'm from a family of five here in the UK and I've got a brother in Jamaica. So there's six of us, but only five of us have grown up here in the UK. And that was all done by my mum because my dad died when I was three. So my mum has been a single parent bringing us up on her own. And uh, out of family, I've got my eldest brother, who's in Jamaica. My second eldest brother was a police officer. So he joined before me. And some of you may know him because he was in that program, Can't Pay, We'll Take It Away, as one of the bailiffs with his oh, yeah. son, Dale. Yeah. So, yeah, it was um, Delroy and Dale. So Dale was my older brother. He was in policing before he then retired and went on to do other things. So I kind of followed in his footsteps, but not really, because that was never really the intention for me. I was always very sporty, so was involved in a lot of sport at school and kind of felt that I was going to go down that pathway. But as things panned out, I actually ended up joining the police. But the reason for that was a number of factors. So when I left school, I got a job with London Transport, as it was at the time. I, it was one of those um, youth offender, no, sorry, youth training schemes that they used to run, the government ones, where you got £25 a week, £100 a month, which was loads of money when you're 16. So um, I did that for about nine months to a year. And then after that, we were asked what we wanted to do. So we could either go operationally and go on the bus side of things or we could have gone into say like an HR role uh, within the office and I decided that I want you to be operational so I became a bus conductor quite early on at about the age of 17 with the old route masters I was there hanging off the 109 bus that went from South Croydon up into Westminster over the bridge and then down back Black Blackfriars so um, I was, that was one of the routes I did anyway. So I was a bus conductor to start off with. And then I became the driver of the route master. And then after that, I became the one person operator. So buses started to change up then and only a few routes had drivers and conductors. And I became the uh, one person driver of, um, I think it was that route 68. And then I did that for a couple of years. I was probably one of the youngest because they just changed the um, passenger service vehicle license to the age of 18. So I got mine at around the age of 19 um, once they changed it. And I did that for a couple of years, about the age of 21. And then I became a revenue inspector. And it was at that point when we were doing revenue inspectors that um, I decided um, because so many of them had left to join the police and my brother was there, that all of those influences kind of formed my opinion to go and, and become a police officer. So I think if not for that, I probably wouldn't have, but it's because 
people that I knew around me had joined that I thought actually I might as well give it a go and they said oh you'd be really good and I was like okay I'll give it a go so that's how I came to be in policing. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful answer to many young black people they'll really look up to you because you're considered you know a huge influencer you've been an advocate for things such as um, the disproportionate use of stop and search tasering so what advice would you give to a young black person that will see you being interviewed now and say, I want to be just like Janet Hills? What advice would you give to them? What I would say most importantly is that there are so many different factors that impact the black community. A lot of them we know about in terms of stop and search. But then we've also got systemic racism, which isn't always as obvious and overt as we'd like to think. What I think is really key and really important for any young person, even when I joined, this is the one thing that I promised myself that actually I would be authentic. I would be true to myself and I wouldn't I wouldn't change who I am. Don't get me wrong. I have changed along the way. But my core values about wanting to really help my community understand the issues that my community have within policing uh, is what's driven me to do what I've, I've done. Uh, my first posting back in 1991, which was 30 years ago, because I'm now retired, um, my first posting was at Brixton. So I was coming from Croydon and, you know, Brixton to me was the place where they had riots because back in the 80s, that's what you saw. You saw it on TV. You knew there was a lot of black people there. And to be fair, it was a bit intimidating to me. But ultimately, when I got there, seriously, it had to have been the best posting that I, I had. I was there for 15 years before I went off and did other departments. So I went into human trafficking. I went off to a different CID. Um, so when I, when I, when I um, became a sergeant, I got promoted to become a detective sergeant. It was at that point that I thought I need to go back to Brixton. I need to go back to Lambeth to where black people are as a line manager to be able to help them even more because as you go up the ranks, your influence grows. So that's what I did. So for any young person that's even considering coming into policing, what I would say is that it's one thing to be on the outside and hear what happens on the inside. And to be honest with you, you need to come in with your eyes open and understand what the issues are, issues are. but you also need to, be able to come with solutions as well and understand that your presence uh, can then inspire someone else or indeed help your community when they see someone that looks like them, speaks the same language, has a similar culture, that actually that makes all the difference. And as much as I've arrested bad person after bad person, what is really important is that a lot of those people, when they dealt with me, were like, thanking me as they left and said oh thank you and that's because I treated them with dignity and respect I've got to do my job but you do it to the best of your abilities and again treating people with respect and dignity. Thank you for that answer because you talked about diversity in the police force and why it's important and following on from that you've acted as the chair of the Met Police Association and the Black Police Association so what what advice would you give to, to the Met, for example, to deal with things such as institutional racism? Because racism, because there's lots of young people, especially from the Black community, Asian community, that there's this element of distrust with the police force, and especially in recent times, that distrust has increased. So, what yeah. advice would you give to the Met? So, I guess my advice would more be to the young person or anyone that is thinking about joining so in terms of policing and the role it probably has the most diverse sort of role structure you could ever ask for if there's anything that you've thought about doing in life policing will generally cover it so you know in terms of training school you can become a trainer you can get qualifications with that if you like animals you've got dogs you've got horses you know there is just so much in terms we've got you know the helicopter we've got boats 
There is so much that you can do within policing if you're fit or you like, you know, keeping keeping fit, doing sporty stuff. There are units that actually deal with that. There is so much that you can do uh, where your talent will be suited within policing. However, what what from my perspective, what is seen is only the bad things around policing. And my rationale, it might be a bit of a conspiracy theory, but if you try to disenfranchise uh, black people or people of difference joining the police service by things like stop and search over, is overuse, then people become, let's say, disenfranchised by it. They don't want to join. And then similarly, if you know you are under the lens when you are within the service for misconduct, then again, you'll have people leave it. But the reality is, is that it is a fantastic job. It is probably the, one of the best things that I could have chosen to do with my life, with my career. And ultimately, what is needed, is if you can push past that, if you can push past off all of the sort of, sort of grey mist and all the smog and, and get through to the other side, you can have what is, I think, a really successful career. Ultimately, what people tend to think is that, you know, that you hear the, the sort of um, the comms around young black boys, knife crime, violent crime, all of that. We're not the only people in London that has um, imp knife crime impacts on. So in terms of that, it's almost like um, propaganda in, you know, around young black people. So, again, it's, again, subconsciously putting them off wanting to join because of all of that. But if we were to join, you know, I think that, that what's stopping us is the fact that white people are scared of having black people in charge. That's my own thing, because actually, you know, there's all this rhetoric around violence and, you know, the way we are that ultimately, if they see us in a position of power, then that becomes a fear thing. So if you disenfranchise communities from joining and then the people that are there don't get to stay, then you keep the status quo with the control and the power. Because there is a lot of power that comes with being a police officer. And that is, for me, the reason why there's this constant narrative and this constant struggle to recruit and get people to stay. But then ultimately, the denial of institutional, institutional racism existing is also another. Ahmed? Yeah. Um, I'll say sometimes, obviously, you do trust and don't trust, but before that, trust can kind of happen, and it's not going to happen anytime soon unless something from the top happens. Simple as that. You know, how can we trust um, police? You know, even just starting from the, Steve, the whole Steve Lawrence case, just from there, you know, happen from the top even at the bottom <clears throat> but the bottom don't know any better because the top don't know any better same now again even the question i was asked to young kids um work young you know blaming this you know black people basically you know work you know for the police you know be peace officers like <laughs> no ask the same question now you're going to get the same response and there's, and there's no trust but before the trust comes change has to occur from the top before trust can even even we can even talk about trust because it ain't gonna happen unless stuff it happen on the top and, and, I, and I don't think anything from the top is happening you may have something else to say but no, no, I, agree. I agree in, in so much that as well you know stop and search doesn't help because if people who are 10 are going to be stopped that's influencing their decisions for the future you know that's influencing the fact that they feel that i've done nothing wrong but yet i'm being stopped so then that trust that you know confidence in policing is being eroded away so it's a really fine line that we have to tread we know it exists. We know that um, our communities have a lack of confidence and trust in policing. And that is where a lot of the work needs to go in rebuilding that trust. And you're right, it does need to come from the top. We're and gonna, Sorry to cut you off, Jenny. We're going to hear from the audience again, but I just wanted to ask you before we did, do you feel like it would be a change if there was more BME people working in the force? Again, the, the example I'll use is around women in policing in, in particular, and in an industry. We've had a gender pay gap review where we know that women get paid less. So for me, there needs to be a tipping point. And they say it's like 30% of your um, employees, um, once you get to that point, you can then influence what happens around you and those changes. So the answer is yes. For us to be really be able to make those changes, you have to do it from within. 
You can't be doing it from outside. And you said it was 30%. What's, do you know the percentage currently? No, it is, it is around oh, 30% okay. marker. So for gender, they're sort of around about 28%. Okay. And in policing, we are around 6% nationally. And that's 13% in policing. But then you've got a community which is 40 plus percent of African Caribbean. Thank you so much for that. Again, it was just such a fantastic answer to get your your perspective. Outside of policing, you are a talented netballer. You're also a head coach for, is it Swanley Netball Club? Swanley, yes, yeah, Swanley. And you also featured on England Netball. So please just tell us about your hobbies and just your advice for young women that aspire just to get involved in sports because we know there's issues around inclusion and there's a whole generation of talented female athletes that I think the nation is missing. So what advice would you give to young ladies that love sports? You know, for me, engaging with young women in sport is, is just the best ever because there is so much talent. And in terms of netball, you don't have to be a performance level athlete. You can do netball just to be with your friends and just to have some fun and just learn a sport. And if you're good, then you can progress yourself and your coach will help you to do that. And that is what I love around netball because we're not a performance-based club. However, we've got different levels of athletes. So, you know, you've got your performance level, but then you've got your person that wants to come along for a bit of fun and a bit of social. So we cover the whole range um, and I, I, I think with in terms of people or young girls in particular or young women wanting to join, you shouldn't see it as this really competitive environment. It can be like that if you want it to be. But at the same time, it can also be somewhere where you just hang out with the girls, have a bit of fun, throw a ball around, keep a bit fit and, you know, just have a good time. So for me, I would definitely encourage anyone that wanted to uh, join a netball club or any kind of sport, really. But um, in terms of netball, we're always looking for players over at Swanley. So, yeah, I'd be more than happy to invite you to come along and try us out. What Black History Month means to me is that we're able to shine a spotlight on the month of October to celebrate black culture and its contribution to the UK. Recognising those that have gone before and those that are here now who will pave the way for the future. It's important for England Netball to celebrate Black History Month so that we can be truly reflective of the communities that make up this great sport and their contributions to it. What Netball means to me is that we're able to showcase our talent and the excellence of women in sport. What I love about Netball is regardless of a person's creed or colour, it's inclusive to all. Thank you so much for that. I'm even following on from that currently Black History Month. So one question I wanted to ask you is who are the Black figures that inspired you the most and why? Oh, do you know what? So Michelle Obama has come on the scene late. So no one knew about Michelle Obama until she became the first lady. But in terms of the short time that she's been there, the eight years that she's been there, it was, it was roughly about the same time that I was chair. So I became the first female chair in 20 years for the Metropolitan Black Police Association. And Michelle Obama was coming in roughly about that time. So we did our first lady bits together. And for me, she, if I could model myself on anyone, it would absolutely have to be her. She just so naturally warm and welcoming. And she says the most inspirational things uh, that, you know, it just encourages, encourages all the time. So that is probably one of the biggest, I mean, alongside her husband, of course, who is also awesome. Um, but in terms of Michelle Obama, definitely. In terms of, again, some of my other pastimes, I love music. So, you know, I find that unwinding to, you know, good tune. So Stevie, Stevie Wonder, again, with his own activism through music, is always giving you a message. And I've, I absolutely love him in terms of the music that he puts out, the meaning behind the music, uh, and the fact that he's so talented. So again, you know, that's one 
another, another thing that inspires me. It might not necessarily be directly in terms of like Michelle Obama taking the stage and doing that, but in terms of his music, absolutely inspirational. And, you know, there are other sort of dotted around in terms of, you know, people being out there and just doing their things. And some of them, you know, if I take my mum, for instance, you know, my mum brought up five children on her own. And that takes some going because we weren't all sort of like angelic with halos. And in terms of what she's done and how she's done it, definitely my mum. Uh, I, I get my resilience from her and she is a warrior to be sort of like reckoned with. So, yeah, it, first and foremost, it probably has to be my mum, because if not for her, I probably wouldn't be in this space. Thank you just for giving all of those wonderful reasons for all of your heroes. I particularly like the Michelle Obama, Steve Wonder, and also your, your tribute to your mother, which is really nice. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and to, to be fair, now in my later life. Um, I have a daughter. So I I've been in policing for just over 30 years. And my daughter is 37. So when I joined, she would have been seven years old. So, and I was a single parent and I was bringing her up through all of that. She is now really successful. I say really successful. I think she's really successful, but she's a, a district nurse. So she does, you know, through the COVID and, lockdown she was doing her thing which was awesome but the best thing is is that I've got a grandson who is called Noah who's three who is just my heartbeat and you know everything that I've done in life I want to be able to share with him and inspire him to be the best that he can be in life so yeah and he calls me Janma so <laughs> <laughs> which is a quirky take on my name but also in terms of I'm too young to be a grandma. I look too young, right? To be a <laughs> so, yeah, he calls me Janma and it's just such a wonderful, you know, to have him and just be part of his life growing up. Thank you so much for that. And um, one thing I admire about you is your enormous courage. So you recently did an interview with The Guardian where you talked about them having a zero tolerance approach towards sexist banter. And um, I just wanted to ask you, is why do you think it is important in restoring the trust between the Met and the public in which it serves? Because we had the case of Sarah Everard. So I just wanted just to um, ask you that question. So in terms of trust and confidence with any community or any community of people, that, that is key. That is key to policing legitimacy. It is key to why we do the job. So in terms of our principles, you've got the police are the public and the public are the police. And we should be reflective of society if we're going to understand and be able to police it at its best. We need the community to engage with us so that we can solve crime together. And for me, having a more diverse workforce as I said, just adds to our legitimacy in doing what we're there to do. Thank you so much. And you also did a really powerful interview on BBC One Extra. It was a panel discussion on Stephen Lawrence with Dory yeah. Lawrence and a number of other influential figures. So what I just wanted just to ask you is how, in terms of the McPherson inquiry, how did that impact you and where do you believe we are now in resolving some of these issues? So again, if we link it to the whole misogyny, sexism, what we tend to do in terms of policing, so the McPherson inquiry and the review and the report that followed in 1999 was meant to restore and rebuild trust and confidence, particularly with Black communities. There were a number of recommendations there that should have been seen through. They, it wasn't a tick box exercise for you to go through and say, we tick that, we tick that, we tick that. This is continuation. And not only is it continuation, it is being able to adapt to society as society changes. And that for me has not happened. What we do is we've looked at race as 
a single strand. But in reality, I am in the gender strand and I'm also in the disability strand. And now because of my age, I'm in the age strand. So I've got at least four protected characteristics. But if you're only ever dealing with one, and in particular the one that you can see, then you're not actually dealing with the problem as a whole. Mm. What needs what needs to happen is a different approach needs to, to happen in terms of instead of saying, oh, this is racism, sexism, you know, disability, discrimination, we should deal with it as actually banter for sexism is a no, banter for banter of any of that type is a no. Because what it does is it creates a culture of tolerance. So people just say, oh, it's just a joke. I was only joking. But the impact is not really felt. So from my perspective, what needs to happen is you need to look at the problems because, you know, in terms of my own experience, I was never really able to differentiate which was racism, which was sexism, or was it both? Do, do you know what I mean? It, it just never was. All I knew was that I felt like I was treat, being treated differently for a particular reason or not, as the case may be. But a lot of the time, I, I wasn't able to differentiate. And what needs to happen in terms of, you know, the Stephen Lawrence and the McPherson inquiry mm -hmm. is that that should have been progressed. It should have been progressed to include other protected characteristics and strands so that all of the applicable things that have happened in terms of those recommendations can be applied to virtually all of the protected characteristics. And my viewpoint is, is if you can get it right for race, you can get it right for all the other protected characteristics. So whereas people are calling for this, this sort of like Stephen Lawrence moment or this McPherson moment in terms of the sexism, for me, that has not done what it was there to do, which was rebuild the trust and confidence from black communities. It hasn't done that. And for me, we needed to progress. We need to adapt. We need to be more flexible with our thinking and look at the whole nine protected characteristics as a whole and not as individual strands, because then we're more likely to see the gaps that are occurring, especially for black women in policing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Your advice is really sound because I actually work in policy. So what you're, what, so what you're saying kind of overlaps with um, the stuff that I do. So just saying thank you for that. I'd also like to just draw upon the fact that you've been interviewed on platforms such as Channel 4 and you've been involved in many powerful discussions. What are some of the values that have carried you throughout your career? You know what? I just, in, in terms of this role, so I retired as a detective sergeant, which is one level up supervisory-wise, um, and then becoming the chair in 2013, I was the first female and also the longest serving because I, I chaired it for eight years. And then within that time, between 2015 and 2017, I became the national president. So all I would say is that it is really important that you anchor yourself, that you take a grounded approach to doing your role. Because there is a lot of influence here and there's a lot of power, whether you're a police officer or whether, you know, in terms of what you said, the sort of platforms that I've had, the sort of people I've met, that you can get really carried away with that. And what you need to have around you are good people. You know who they are. Some of them will be your family. Some of them will be your friends. Some of them will be your colleagues. But you need to have, various people around you that will keep you anchored. For, from a woman's perspective, we always sort of like, you know, want to ask the question, does my bum look big in this? You need people around you that actually say, yes, love, you put on weight. Not people that say, actually, love, no, it looks fine, when really they know that there's an issue there. And that's what's really, really key for, for me anyway, to have survived. And I, I say survived because, you know, you're constantly having, you know, battles around certain issues where you're having to put your case forward and defend your position. 
which can be exhausting. So it's really, really important that you have people around you that keep you grounded and that you can go to for advice and guidance uh, around certain things. And just try not to let your head get too big and for things to run away with you. It, it's so easy to fall into that space, especially with all the social media that we've got out there and, you know, everything's a selfie or, you know, you're there sort of like promoting something that actually isn't about the real issues that you're there to represent. So I would say just keep yourself grounded, go in with the right mindset, have people around you that will pull you back into line if you get out of London. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And just following on from that, you were awarding the MBE for your services to police in, and uh, your in community relations. And there'll be lots of young people that will look at your life, see that, see that you've shared platforms of likes of Leroy Logan, David Lammy, and they will they will might think, okay, I want to impact Janet, impact the community the way that Janet has. So what advice would you give to young people that want to change society by fighting for the causes they are most passionate about? You know what? Just again, sometimes it does take a lot of courage to have a voice. When I started policing, I never thought that that would be me. Uh, when I went for being chair, I didn't think anyone would vote for me. I didn't think I would get in. What I would say is embrace the power within. Embrace that courage that you've got within yourself. Because once you do that, it unleashes all of your potential. Um, and I've got this sort of stock phrase that I use, em embrace the power within to empower yourself beyond. Because when you take that negative energy and embrace it and pump it out into something positive, mm. magical good things happen. But a lot of the time when we feel the fear, we, send, we tend to shy away from it. But mm. when you embrace it, when you get the butterflies in your stomach when you're about to be interviewed on Channel 4 or Newsnight or when you're going even for your school, you've got an event where you might be speaking or a play or music and you get those butterflies, embrace them because they're there actually not as a negative, but actually for you to unleash your potential. So that's my advice. Thank you. I just want to draw upon the fact that you talked about um, public speaking. There are some young people that struggle with public speaking because it can be quite daunting seeing lots of people looking at you. So what advice would you give to young people who struggle in this area? Because there are some young people with brilliant ideas. They're just not sure how to communicate it in front of an audience. What I would say is it, it, that was me. Absolutely. Uh, I remember one of the reasons why I didn't want to take the role of chair was because I knew that I'd have to be the spokesperson and it was just so daunting. I was like, I'm going to get it all wrong. And if you see my very first interviews, which I hope have been, been scrapped, um, yeah, it was very different to the person that I am now. But what I did do was I, I just went away and I researched it. There's so much online now uh, in terms of like YouTube is a really good influencer you know, you can Google public speaking, you can go and take lessons in public speaking and build your confidence, you can get your family to sit and, you know, while you practice and get them to listen and get them to sort of like, you know, assist you with, you know, eye contact or speaking up or raising your head. All of these little things are achievable because that's all I've done. I haven't gone out anywhere and paid like a tutor to do that for me it's all been self-taught and there's so much on the internet that you can self-teach and the main thing is practice 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 and the more you do it the better you become so thank you this this interview has been so fantastic and the final question i'd like to ask you is what are the greatest challenges you've faced over your professional career and what are some of the lessons you learned from these experiences so some of the biggest challenges for me is raising the the issue. So talking about racism, you know, that is 
not a topical, well, it's a topical subject now, but it's not your typical after dinner conversation that you want. And for me, it has been for the last eight years anyway, before I got into it, it's been something that I've always had to do. And it's challenging and it becomes tiring and you become frustrated because you are saying the same things over and over and over again. Um, but one of the things that's kept me, as I said, on point and true to who I am, true to what I know is right, true to being an activist and talking truth to power is one, open myself up to learning, understanding what the underlying issues are. But also, as I mentioned earlier, is, is about having the right people around you. And um, whether that's family, friends or colleagues, then you've got them there to help you sometimes when, you know, it, it gets to you. Because it, it, it does. You know, I, I know many a, peop- many a person that has suffered with mental health uh, around racism, sexism, all of these things, because you have to have an outlet. You have to have some way of, of, of letting it out, speaking to someone about the problem, getting it off of your chest. So in terms of your mental health, you know, if you find yourself getting frustrated and because you are saying what needs to be said, um, I would definitely find you know yourself someone who you can speak to about that so that actually you're not harboring it you're not keeping it contained and that you're able to speak and get it out and what I would also say is again the BPA and the network that I've belonged to have been key for that if if not for the members uh, and being able to advocate on their behalf I probably wouldn't have been in this role because you don't benefit in any way, shape or form, it is very challenging. And it does take a lot of courage to say the things that potentially your membership won't say, but that's what you're for, um, and to come out and say it. So again, if you haven't got a network, form a network of like-minded individuals who can support you in the cause, whatever that is. So um, that would be my advice. Thank you. For such an exceptional interview. I thoroughly enjoyed interviewing you. Um, I wish you. you all the best post retirement and just want to thank you for all of your work in the National Black Police Association and the Metropolitan Black Police um, Association as well. So thank you. No, and thank you for inviting me to this interview. I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.